morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where in the world you're joining us from today. Today, we are going to be kicking off our first Masters of Management, let's call that MM going forward, sample lecture for the new year. And you're in for a very special treat today. We have a guest lecturer, Dr. Wayne Rockcliffe with us. And he is going to be kicking off a wonderful, fun, and engaging sample lecture. So you guys are all in for a treat for today. But before we get into everything, I'd like to acknowledge that UBC's Vancouver Point Grey campus is situated on the traditional, ancestral, unceded territory of the Musqueam people. I would also like to acknowledge that you are joining us today from many places near and far and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. We will start things off with some introductions. I'll do a brief overview of the MM program, followed by some Q&A. So if you've got any kind of uh, admissions uh, or recruitment related questions, you can type those questions up in the chat or use the raise your hand feature um, to ask any kind of admissions related questions. We'll take a few moments to do that. And um, throughout the session, we can even answer some of those admissions related questions in the chat with the, with the help of my team. And then we'll be launching into the real reason you all logged in today, which is to attend uh, a fun and engaging sample lecture le led by um, Dr. Ray Rockcliffe. And you'll also get the opportunity to ask him some questions and participate in, a, in some fun exercises and activities led by him. Uh, so who's in the virtual room today? I'll start off by introducing myself. Um, I'm Natalie Sirwester-Phil and I'm a recruitment and admissions manager. With me on my team, I have the very talented Tamara Stanova. Uh, Tamara is responsible for all of our magic behind the scenes. She helps uh, make our events run smoothly and gets the word out there about our events. And uh, so she's a wonderful resource to leverage on our team if you have any questions about the program as well. And with us, we also have uh, Ananya. She is joining us today. Uh, she's a co-op student, uh, but nonetheless, she really helps support us and our team to make all uh, of our events run smoothly as well and also a great resource to leverage. So thank you both for being with us and you know helping us run our operations. We really appreciate you. And... Um, now I'd like to introduce our very special guest who's here with us today, Dr. Wayne Rockcliffe. Uh, Dr. Wayne Rockcliffe, he, it's an absolute honor to have you joining us. Um, Dr. Rockcliffe has been and has an extensive background working in education and in industry. He has worked extensively with all le levels of leadership in public, private, and not-for-profit sector organizations. Um, he has supported these organizations in successfully developing and implementing organizational improvement initiatives. He is recognized for bringing humor and creativity into his class. I'm sure you'll see some of that today. And Dr. Rockcliffe is an instructor in the Organizational Behavior and Human Resources Division at UBC Sauter, where he teaches HR courses. Um, at the undergraduate level and at the graduate level. Um, and he teaches on topics such as building high performance teams, business acumen for leaders and courses on leadership and, and many more. He's a faculty mentor uh, for several, several HR case competitions and a supervisor for the Masters of Management community projects. His community involvement has included being a director on the Calgary Family Service Bureau Board and Director of the Kensington String Orchestra Board. He is currently the Director of the Coast Social Enterprise Council, Director of the BC Organizational Development Network, and an active mentor for the BCO. Uh, so very busy person, uh, so uh, an extreme honor and privilege to have him here with us today. So we will launch into the, the his lecture component in just a few moments. Um, but just a few uh, housekeeping items. Um, so please feel free to type in any questions you have throughout, throughout the session on the chat panel, the Q&A, or when we're kind of in a, a session that where we ask for engagement or question asking, feel free to use the raise your hand feature and uh, you can definitely ask your questions and make your comments uh, by that uh, medium as well. 
So let's dive right into the uh, overview of the MBAN program before we launch into the, the sample lecture session. Our, MBAN, our MM program is a nine-month program. It is a full-time program and it's right offered right here in Vancouver where we're dialing in from. And Vancouver has consistently been ranked one of the most livable cities um, for a variety of reasons, but um, a key reason is because of the, the nice temperate climate and the surrounding mountains, the, the oceans and the sky that you get by being a student here. Essentially, you get to study at a highly ranked, globally renowned university in one of the world's best cities. The MM course is designed for graduates from non-business bachelor's degrees. And some of the eligible uh, faculties on campus that we have are Faculty of Forestry, Arts, Land, Food System Science, Kinesiology, Music, amongst many others. Um, and this program gives you the ability to build your bachelor's degree with business knowledge so that you can elevate your career before launching yourself into the workforce. The program also includes a three month consulting project so that you can start building your work experience and start making an impact right away with hands-on experience. You'll also have the opportunity to engage and collaborate and network with local businesses on group projects, Put your business skills to work on community enhancing projects such as business planning, market expansion, community planning, and environmental sustainability initiatives, and much more. Uh, and also career programming. That is something that is embedded within the course. So starting day one, you're provided with the resources and the training to empower you towards career readiness. So you're consistently getting training that ensures that you're set up and ready for the job market. And whether that means building your own personal brand, getting interview ready, or getting support on your CV, we have designate, a designated team to, to support you and ensure that you feel supported uh, throughout your, your journey so that you're ready for the job market. You'll also have access to one-on-one -on -one coaching, access to alumni and a mentorship network, uh, and also the ability to engage with our partner, partner connections so that you can uh, leverage lots of great career development resources uh, to elevate your strengths and help support you in your areas for development. Let's uh, talk about preparing uh, your application. So we have a very holistic evaluation process when we're assessing candidates. We, we take the full picture into consideration when we're making any kind of admissions related decisions. Yes, we'll look at your academic background, but we're also assessing your professionalism, your community involvement, your communication skills, your interpersonal skills. These are all important criteria that we take into consideration when we're making any kind of uh, admissions related decision. Of course, you know, we'll look at your transcripts to, to assess and evaluate whether you can keep up with the, the level of the program and also your, your references. We accept professional or academic. Uh, looking at some important deadlines, uh, keep some important deadlines in mind that are coming up. Our next big deadline is in March for international students. So make sure you're leveraging our team to help support you in the weeks to come uh, leading up to March so that you're you're able to put your best foot forward. Our admissions team is here to support you. Our, our uh, advisors are here to guide you. So, so make sure you're leveraging us. And UBC Sauter also offers a variety of merit-based scholarships for our programs. Uh, to help finance your education. And more information on our scholarship opportunities can be found on our webpage. So make sure you're, you're checking those out. And that's, that's it on my end for a quick summary on our uh, Masters of Management program. Um, I'd like to now open things up to some, some questions. If there are any, any admissions related questions, I can take a few now, uh, but I'd love to Kind of leave a lot of time for the engaging portion of today's session, which is uh, Dr. Rockliffe's lecture. I see a, 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 a raised hand um, uh, by a gentleman here, uh, Butahan. Uh, please go ahead and ask your question. Uh, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Good morning. Thanks for logging in. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I just had a question. Um, are the deadlines that I see on the screen, um, are they for the uh, bachelor's plus 
uh, MM degree, are they the bachelor plus MM degree deadlines or uh, are they the actual master degree deadlines? Yeah, so this is the master's uh, deadlines. Uh, the B plus MM, which is the program that you're referring to, has slightly different deadlines. And we can share the link of those exact deadlines for you in the chat. A, a great question that we had that came through was with regards to the application and if there were some essay components involved in the application. And the answer to that is yes. So there's two longer essay questions and uh, one shorter essay questions that you'll be answering. And each of those essays have word limits and um, the, the questions are, are, are different every year. And uh, once you start your application, you'll be able to get a glimpse into what some of those questions are. Okay, I have another question here about uh, GMAT GRE scores. So like I said, we, we do have a very holistic evaluation process when we're looking and assessing candidates. And, um, you know, although we do like to see a competitive GMAT GRE score, which, you know, for the GRE might be about a 320, for the GMAT might be about a 650, uh, we do take the full person into consideration. Uh, so if you've got some strong uh, marks supporting your overall academic, overall academics, we'll, we'll look at those as well. So great question there. And uh, so we have a question about the admissions uh, deadlines. So we actually review uh, applications on a, on a rolling basis. So we don't wait until a deadline before we're looking at um, your application. We will review them as they come in. So if your application is, is close to that finish line, you don't, don't wait until the deadline to submit it. Submit it as soon as possible because the sooner you submit, the sooner you have an answer on your application. And especially um, if you do need any kind of visa and immigration support, getting the ball rolling on those types of things is uh, encouraged uh, just because processing times are consistently changing. So it's, it's good to get ahead of that curve. Okay, wonderful. Well, now I would like to turn things over to our guest lecturer today. Dr. Wayne Rockcliffe will be giving an engaging lecture on organizational behavior. Uh, Dr. Rockcliffe, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Natalie. Well, the pressure's on to be uh, to be um, interesting and engaging. So, welcome everyone. I've been teaching in the MM program for a while, years now, and it is my favorite program across the entire graduate school. It is the only interdisciplinary program. So we get people from kinesiology, communication, food and land systems, from public policy, from arts, from history, from fine arts. We get people from theater and uh, actors. We get writers. It is just a, a really a phenomenal uh, program where you uh, uh, typically I teach in the business school and I see business people all day long. And then I come into the MM program and I see this rich collage of uh, people from all sorts of discipline who think differently about the world, think differently about problems and bring to bear a whole range of perspectives. It, uh, it really is one of my favorite programs. So thanks for inviting me today, Natalie, and um, having me part of, uh, part, of the, uh, part of the event today. So I'm, I've got a, 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 bit of a, a bit of a mock lecture that I've put together. So today I, I, I thought a topic that might be interesting and engaging uh, would be uh, to talk a little bit about leadership. We are in an interesting time in history. We, for the first time in history, have organizations that are larger than some countries' economies. We have uh, Apple with $3 trillion of market capitalization, 300,000 employees. We've got Amazon, trillions of uh, dollars in revenue. Um, these are economies we've got. Uh, so leadership in business is different when you have businesses that touch the entire globe. We've got complex supply chain. We have complex um, complex um, political relationships uh, within government. We're seeing the whole uh, trying to wrestle with climate change. 
Uh, in, in our cities, we're dealing with the complexity of diversity in cities, diversity. So every aspect of our experience is challenging leadership, political leadership, business leadership, community leadership. Uh, so I thought that would be an interesting question to kind of play with a little bit and, uh, and unpack. I'm going to bring a couple ideas in. I'm going to ask you what you think and what your experience is. And if we have time, um, maybe just a little bit of what the research and the theory uh, is saying. So that's kind of the roadmap of where, um, where I'd like to go um, today. So I wanna see who's in the room. So just in the chat window, if you could just post in, what is, what is your faculty and major um, of study? Just take a moment to pop that in the, uh, in the chat. Double major sustainable in government, thank you. Physics, excellent. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, Bosco. Economics and computer science, uh, computer science, international relations, psychology, international relations, computer science. I'm seeing a theme here. Business admin, marketing and psych, kinesiology, uh, arts economics. Theater, acting, Song Lin, great to see you. Kevin, thanks. Kendra, Joshua, language and translation. Rewa, thank you. Welcome. So we have got quite a quite a range of discipline and study and background. So let's use that to advantage in our in our discussions uh, today. Um, Natalie's already introduced me, so I won't uh, uh, make a comment about that. So today's lesson, setting the foundation. The question is, what, what is leadership? We, I think we know when we're in the presence of someone who is an effective leader. We know when we're in the presence of somebody who's an ineffective leader. The difficulty is, is when we try to codify or take that tacit understanding and experience and say, well, what's a definition? What's a working definition of leadership that we can use as a starting place for our discussion? So if you were to finish this sentence, leadership is, what would you say? Uh, and if you wanna just unmute and speak, or if you wanna post in the, um, in, the, in the chat, and I may do some call outs. So Bosco says it's about action. If, if there's no action, we, it, it, it's, it's not leadership. So leadership is inherently about getting things done. It's about, it's about action. Other, other thoughts. Thanks, Bosco. So I'm going to ask, a, I'm going to call in a couple people. You can, uh, you can, um, oh, that's, that, that made some people nervous. Okay. Guiding others, engaging teams. So Natalie, what is, engaging teams mean when you when you think about that i think it's about understanding your team and leveraging everyone's strength and helping each other develop each other's weaknesses okay excellent um Manaz, what do you what do you work working with others if we look at politics right now a lot of the leadership in politics is about creating divisiveness and uh, us and them. And if you're not with us, you're against us. And you're saying leadership is about bringing people together. Can you say a little more about what your thinking is? Oh, okay. Thanks, Manas. Her mic's not working. Uh, so Celine, what do you think when you're thinking of encouragement? What does that, what does that look like? What's your experience of, of encouragement as a leadership characteristic? That's one. Promoting egalitarianism. What is the? What are you thinking? Um, so egalitarianism uh, basically means uh, equal, like absolute equity, uh, not equality, but absolute equity. Uh, it's in the um, official motto of the Republic of France as well. And basically, if you're leading like an organization, uh, you made reference to politics. Well, that's a really a uh, you know controversial concept. But if you're if you're talking about like small teams. Uh, organizations, you know, uh, promoting equality is key because otherwise you'd become a boss and you would become a dictator rather than actually leader. 
um, and this would uh, cause a demotivation of uh, your fellow colleagues and uh, as a result nothing would be productive and you would not look like a leader. Whereas if you uh, encourage egalitarianism, if you sort of put yourself in the same level with your fellow colleagues, if you work with them, understand them, uh, you know, it's gonna, gonna increase motivation and very, like your colleagues are gonna become confident in you and vice versa. Great, thank you. Thank you. And Celine has said that she learned some of this in, uh, in clubs at school. So now we're beginning to craft a bit of a working definition from our experience. We say leadership is about action. Leadership's about motivation. Leadership is about taking care of teams and allowing participation and growing skill. Um, it is about doing that in a way that has uh, uh, distribution of participation. So we have voice around the table and uh, perspectives around the table. So we're, we've, we've got a bit of a, uh, a working definition here. Marin says that it's also about taking risks toward the achievement of a better future or what we might call a vision. So we've got action, vision, motivation, uh, teams, uh, and creating an opportunity for everyone to participate in moving towards this future. That's a, we've, we've kind of got a working definition. So let's, let's test it. Are there some beliefs or assumptions that we have that, about leadership that might be helpful? And do we have some that might be um, maybe not helpful? Maybe it's from our family, uh, from our culture, from all sorts of traditions that inform our mental models and perspectives and thoughts about leadership that, um, that may no longer suit or may longer fit. Uh, Jaheed says it's about the big picture. Um, so Ava said it requires extroversion. Can I, I'm just, so I'm just going to make a comment. I'm going to stop because I think that's a brilliant insight that and I hear this in the business school all the time you've got to speak out you've got to be loud you've got to fight through the noise and make yourself heard and yet I think as leaders we have an obligation for that quiet voice in the corner who is thinking deeply about complex things to be heard um, so I, I mentioned Apple. Everyone loves to talk about Apple. It's a big organization. It's a successful. It has huge market capitalization. Tim Cook, who currently leads uh, Apple, is an introvert and quite an introvert. So this notion that extroversion, uh, extroverts have the, uh, an advantage in leadership is somewhat true. But the evidence in the research uh, suggest that introverts can be equally as effective in business leadership. They just do it differently than the extroverted leader. So let's let's continue. We've got quite a bit of discussion. So let's let's test this working definition. So we've got this this working definition. The question is, what are the issues that are facing leadership? If leadership is about action and getting the best ideas and thoughts from the team in order to uh, move towards a better future. What are the barriers, the issues that are facing organizations? So what I'd like to do now is to put you into um, breakout groups just for five minutes. And I put some Google Slides together. And the question is, what are the issues that are facing um, Leaders today, leaders tomorrow. So when you graduate and enter the workforce, what are the leadership issues? Are they ethical issues? Are they issues around climate change, poverty, distribution of wealth? Um, what are the issues that are dealing with, uh, that leaders are, are gonna be dealing with? I'll see you in five minutes. Uh, we're gonna put you into some breakout rooms, have a discussion. Find your room number slide. So if you're in room one, go to slide one. If you're in room two, go to slide two. If you're in room three, go to slide three. Make some notes and then we'll have a look at those. Uh, I'm gonna ask a couple of the groups to present out when you, uh, when you come back. See you in five. Well, welcome back. I've been following the discussions. There's some interesting uh, things going on. I'm just gonna call in a couple of groups um, to kind of uh, give us a, a, 
a, a, a bit of a review of your discussion. So who is in group one that can take us through the slide? So Kendra wrote the first point. Um, uh, I, I will leave uh, Kendra to explain that in more detail, but uh, I can elaborate on the second point, uh, linguicism. So linguicism, uh, as you can see on the slide, is basically a type of bigotry. So uh, uh, the definition is on the slide, discriminating people based on language, race, speak, or accent they use. Uh, we always hear um, like racism, uh, sexual orientation-based discrimination. There are enough awareness campaigns on these types of bigotry, uh, so we are very well aware of them and their consequences, but we never hear of linguicism as an actual type of discrimination. And it is real, and there's a lot of evidence to back it up. Um, and, and there are barely any awareness campaigns. Most people are uninformed that such a thing exists, uh, when indeed it, it's parallel with uh, racism and it consequences uh, and so linguism, can you can you kind of walk us through what would be an example of uh, linguicism and how it would play out as a kind of disadvantage or discrimination linguicism exists in the workplace it is powered by economic prospects by large corporations uh, and Kendra actually added a lot onto this uh, she said that if linguicism exists, that means there will be sort of, uh, what do you call it, uh, seclusion, separation, and this may lead to lack of motivation, which uh, finally will uh, result in lack of productivity. Uh, and also, you know, we have to care for, the, uh, for our colleagues' emotions as well. Uh, basically, we have to include, uh, basically to eradicate this issue in the workplace, linguicism, uh, we have to increase diversity and we have to do all we can uh, to um, encourage diversity um, and, e and e equity. Yeah. Great, great insight. Great. Thank you very much. Great summary. Um, uh, linguicism is a really interesting uh, addition to what is normally missing in the conversation. So thank you for, for bringing that in. Certainly in looking at global economies, this whole notion of language proficiency, dominant language, the colonialism of, lang of English being the language of business and the colonial effects of that. Uh, so very interesting. Boy, we could just, we could hang out. Let me go get a beer and we'll hang out and we'll just have that discussion all day. That's fantastic. Kendra, you have your hand up. Hi, yes. Um, yeah, kind of to talk about, like finishing his point before what we talked about, um, what I just said, uh, since we were specifically speaking about leaders, um, kind of like what leaders can do in the face of some of these issues. Um, and I just thought it was uh, an inclusion, like diversity and equity issue, um, which is like affects all types of work. Um, and is involved in like every community that you can find. So um, some of the things um, that I just added were that like the promotion and then like follow through on the plans of action um, within like companies and governments, um, depending on if you're looking at like a specific company's like policy or like the laws within whatever country you're working in. Um, how they can be implemented and how leaders um, kind of hold them accountable. Uh, and then you can see like the change in the culture um, and the staff. Um, but the my main point that I brought up during the discussion was that uh, we're most likely going into recession. So that will affect leaders in all areas, um, just regard, uh, regarding like all like the fiscal aspects of business. So um, yeah, it can like lots of people like tend to go back to school, like budgets tighten up or people might get laid off. Um, and I know in our aspects, um, I'm a varsity athlete at UBC. There was already like a lot of different types of government cuts. And during the pandemic, uh, the prov province of Alberta saw a lot of like government cuts, not necessarily like due to COVID, just because of some changes um, to their uh, sport institutions and a lot of um, teams and like programs had to shut down. Great, thanks Kendra, wow. Um, so we've got, uh, in looking at the other, the other slides as well, we've got 
uh, post COVID, so the, the return to work, but we've also got uh, the, the great resignation. Uh, we have linguicism, we've got EDI, uh, market changes, globalization, supply chain, we've got economic issues, judicial reform, uh, political pressure, uh, Boy, there's a lot of stuff going on uh, cultural. We now live in very diverse, especially in, in larger cities such as uh, Toronto, Vancouver, uh, Montreal in Canada. And is, for instance, English is no longer the dominant language in Vancouver. It's the dominant language of business, but it is no longer the dominant spoken language and hasn't been. So if you're not offering language services or thinking about language issues with your workforce and with your customers, that's a real problem in this uh, in the in the lower mainland. We've got um, uh, the ability to adapt to change, social change, political change, uh, economic change, changes in fiscal policy, uh, capital uh, access to, to to capital. We've got uh, technology change. Uh, the universities right now are all going crazy around uh, Chat CPT and. Uh, how that's going to affect the future of uh, now AI in general is going to affect the future of employment, etc. So we've got you've got some big issues here. Let me go back to the slides. The world is complex, and the challenges that leaders are facing are also complex and myriad. They're social, they're economic, they're political. They are. Uh, uh, um, technological infrastructure but sometimes there are things that we talk about leadership leaders must be action oriented leaders must be uh, equitable they must invite equal voice they must uh, we have all these characteristics of leaders leaders need to be smart they need to understand the business they need to be able to work well with people and be good communicators so I'm, I'm going to end our discussion with a thought exercise, and I'm going to send you uh, off with some homework. And I want you to observe the things that we don't normally notice. So the things that we are told that we should notice are not necessarily the things that are in fact going on. So let's just, I, I, I want to end this, uh, end this with a couple of things. So here's the challenge. The leadership industry is a $40 billion a year industry. Um, filled with people who don't really understand the science, the social science of leadership. These are consultants, trainers, all sorts of people that have been uh, leading us through all sorts of processes and training for 30, 40, 50 years. The question is, do we have better leaders now than we did 20 years ago? That's an interesting question. Do we have less bribe? Do we have less embezzlement, less fraud? Do we have a better environment, more sustainable practices? Are we more ethical in our practices? Do we have fair trade? Do we treat, do we pay people living wages? Um, I'm not convinced that after 40, 50 years of a $40 billion a year on leadership development, that we actually have better leaders. And that's because I don't think we really understand the science of leadership. So here's just, a, I wanna end us a couple of things. So there are, in North America, there are more men named John that run big companies than all the women that run big companies. So this is a funny slide. So who, who can tell me what this actually means? The word John gives us a clue. Culturally, economically, religiously, what is John? Who gets named John? Is it an Arabic name? So. John is typically white, probably Christian, uh, probably uh, middle class, European. So this is a funny little slide, but it, it gives us a little insight into what's going Okay, let's carry on. I'm just going to leave you with a couple more thoughts. Does height matter? No one ever says leadership is about being tall. And yet almost all political leaders and business leaders, men are over six feet tall. Think about the impacts of that, that unconscious bias in who we select and identify as the leader. We still have tribalism in us, that the warrior will take care of us, and the warrior is the big man. Uh, that is deep in our, in our anatomy, it's in our history, it's in our culture, this part of our, uh, the part of our brain, the reptile part of our brain still responds. 
and results in this. There's also an enormous amount of research that says the more attractive you are, the more successful you'll be. As a matter of fact, uh, between five foot four, five foot six uh, to six feet, on average, uh, you will make approximately seven hundred dollars um, more per per year per inch of height. So, what about weight? People that are very very heavy um, uh, will uh, are not represented in leadership in business. These tend to be people that are attractive, fit and tall. Now, maybe those are the attributes of leadership. Uh, what about height and income? Well, it differs for men and women. So we actually pay men and women differently based on their height, their, their attractiveness, <laughs> their... But whenever you ask about the attributes of leadership, no one says how beautiful you are. No one says how attractive you are. No one says how tall you are. We have all these attributes about you have to be uh, 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 action oriented. You have, and I think that's true. You do. So where's the? Where are these unintended systemic things entering into the system? So I here's the homework. I want you to pay attention. Look around whether that's in the news and the media, what you're noticing in politics and business, what are the unintended, or perhaps they are intended, but the unbiased influence of the things that we are not thinking about and, and uh, how they're affecting. Um, so we can talk about um, men and women um, in, in discrimination in the workplace, uh, as well as height. Uh, we can also talk about color, and race, um, do white men make more than black men? Do, do black men make more than black women? Uh, do people of color make? So we can begin to parse this up and go, these social discriminations are actually embedded and realized and expressed in our work environment where we think business is objective. We think capital is agnostic. Capital will go where the opportunity is. That's the model. It's agnostic. It doesn't need to be regulated because the hand of the market will speak. Well, look at this stuff. It is rife with discrimination. I could, I could, I could go on about this, and I love that linguism, uh, linguism uh, came into the discussion as another factor. Um, so here's what we've done today. We've, we've, we've kind of said here's, here's what we think about leadership. Here are the issues that leaders are facing. Here's the reality of the things that actually influence who becomes leaders and in leader positions in organizations. And as business leaders, as coming people coming into the business school, you will become the owners and, and managers and, and, uh, and leaders in business, in politics, in the community in the future. And I hope this has kind of piqued a bit of curiosity to do some further thinking, to notice things, to have this as a conversation over beer and pizza with your friends and with your family um, and how we can actually make things different in the future. Natalie, thank you very much for inviting me to be here. Thanks everyone uh, for, for uh, participating. Uh, this has been a great experience for me and I will hand this back over to the MM team. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rockcliffe for delivering such a fun, engaging and collaborative lecture this morning. It was truly an honor to have you live and to have you present to our team. And uh, that brings, that's bringing us up to the last few moments of our webinar. Um, make sure you're leveraging our admissions team in the weeks to come leading up to our next deadline in March. Uh, book your coffee chats, attend our information sessions. We're regularly hosting Ask Me Anything sessions. You can always reach out to myself directly. I'll put my email address in the chat so that you can reach out and, and leverage our team for uh, your your application support and, and submitting your, your application uh, leading up to our deadline. So thank you so much for joining us today, for your participation and for contributing to the lecture today. We really appreciate your time. Thank you and see you all at the next best time.